Thanks everyone for coming to South Coast Winds Open House. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to join us. And we really appreciate seeing such a full packed room. Maybe next time we'll look to book the school auditorium so we have a bit more room for everyone. Let's see some thumbs up, okay? Um, but yeah, we really appreciate you being here. We hope this presentation is informative. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Kelsey Perry. I'm the Community Liaison Coordinator for South Coast Wind. Um, my role is to communicate with community members, residents of Somerset, Swansea, anyone near and around Brighton Point or interested about the project. So I have cards up here, I have cards over there. Please do reach out to me with questions. My, my personal phone number is on that card. Feel free to give me a call. Um, and I'll have my colleagues here introduce themselves quickly. Let's we'll start with Kelly. Hi everyone, I'm Kelly Smith. I'm the onshore package manager for South Coast Wind. Eric Fraser, I'm the uh, HVDC package manager for South Coast Wind for the transmission system. Yeah, and I'm Tim Ryer. I'm the uh, offshore cables package manager. So looking at the export cables, the, uh, the lease area cables, and yeah, bring them to shore. Perfect, yeah. Yes. So, so we have a really great technical team here with us tonight. Um, and we prepared a pretty technical presentation, but happy to answer questions about anything to do with our project. Um, I do want to address, you know, we, we changed our name from Mayflower Wind to South Coast Wind in February. Um, if you call us Mayflower, that's totally fine, fair game. We know that people are still getting used to it. Nothing else with the project changed. It was just, you know, simply a name change from Mayflower Wind to South Coast Wind. Um, so just wanted to address that off the bat. Um, we will ask you to hold questions until the end of the presentation. Kelly and I will be splitting up the presentation tonight, um, so feel free to please grab a notepad, a pen, jot down your questions during it. Um, and we look forward to having a really robust and informative Q&A following. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and kick off the presentation. I see a lot of familiar faces here, so some of you may have heard pieces of this before. Um, so bear wi with me for the new people in the room. <laughs> South Coast Wind, just to start with the basics, who are we? Um, South Coast Wind is a joint venture. We're an offshore wind project that is backed by Shell New Energies and Ocean Winds. Um, both of our sponsors have a deep experience working in the offshore energy space in both conventional and renewable energy. They have decades of experience working with host communities, building these projects across the globe. Right now, Shell has about five megawatts of offshore wind in their pipeline. Um, about 30% of Shell's portfolio right now is actually renewable energy, and Ocean Winds has about 11 gigawatts in the pipeline right now when it comes to offshore wind. Um, so they're working on lots of projects and they truly have the experience um, to help us build this project in a safe and effective way. So why is this project so important? Of course, I need to touch on climate. Um, our project is a major player to meeting the state's and the nation's net zero emission goals. Um, this is a major renewable energy project that's going to contribute to um, both the, as I said, state and nation's policy. So once the project is in operation, meaning the turbines are in the, in the sea and running, um, our project will eliminate over 4 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually. This is equivalent to shutting down about, about 10 natural gas plants, so there are major carbon emission savings. Um, and our project will account for approximately 8% of the United States goal of procuring 30 gigawatts by, of offshore wind by 2030. Um, so this is a major project. It's 2.4 gigawatts of clean renewable energy um, and really important as we look towards the energy transition here in Massachusetts and as a nation. Here is our project. Um, this is just a broad view scope and then we'll start um, honing in into our Brighton Point project in particular. Outlined here in black, you can see our offshore wind lease area. It's about 127,000 acres or 199 square miles. In the lease area, the turbines will be spaced in a one by one nautical mile grid layout. Um, all of the Southern New England lease areas will have this grid layout for turbines. It's an agreement that developers have come to agree with with the United States Coast Guard. Um, from our lease area, we have two projects. We have one export cable that travels from the northern portion of the lease area through Muskegon Channel and makes landfall in Falmouth, Massachusetts on Cape Cod. Um, I know there's some questions on, on what's going on with that project. We are moving forward in Falmouth. We continue to work with that community. 
And then we have our project um, going to Brayton Point, which we're here to talk about tonight. The export cable in orange extends northwest from the lease area through both uh, federal Rhode Island and Massachusetts state waters through the Sakonet River um, to make landfall at Brayton Point here in Somerset. Just to give you an idea of what the project looks like from turbines to point of interconnection, it can be a little bit hard to visualize what these projects will look like given none exist to the scale in the United States yet. Um, so the South Coast project connecting the Brayton Point, what we refer to as South Coast Wind 1, is everything from the turbines in federal waters all the way to the point of interconnection on Brayton Point. Um, our turbines, as mentioned, will be in the one by one nautical mile layout, about 30 miles south of Martha's Vineyard, 23 miles south of Nantucket. Um, they will be connect, uh, collecting the kinetic energy, converting that to electrical energy. Um, at the offshore HVDC converter station platform offshore, that's where the energy is converted from AC alternating current power to DC direct current power. This <coughs> helps us, um, this helps the power travel longer distances and has less line loss. Um, the cable continues underneath the seafloor at a target depth of about six feet, but a range of three to 13 feet, depending on boulders and other benthic conditions. We do have a brief intermediate crossing over Portsmouth, Rhode Island to be able to get to Brayton Point. Um, that crossing through Portsmouth is about two miles and we haven't landed on the exact route through town yet. The cable will continue out of Portsmouth into Mount Hope Bay for about six miles, four miles in Rhode Island state waters, two miles in Massachusetts state waters, and then eventually make landfall on Brayton Point. Again, the cable will be submerged underneath the seafloor the entire time connect to our HVDC converter station, which Kelly will tell you all about soon, and eventually reach National, get National Grid's existing infrastructure on Brayton Point to connect to the regional grid system. This is where when our energy connects to this POI with National Grid, our energy is dispersed to ISO New England. So everyone in New England, you know, folks in Provincetown, Massachusetts, all the way to Pittsfield, Massachusetts, will benefit from this energy in their electric bills. Just to give you a, li a little bit of a closer insight into how we are planning to get to Brayton Point in the state waters. Um, so this is a, a zoomed in uh, graph of our route going through the Sakonet River. Um, as you can see, the entire cable route is about 95 miles, but there's about 20 miles through Rhode Island state waters and then two more miles through Massachusetts. The cable itself will be configured in a bundle um, so there will be two cables. The two cables together will be about 13 inches of, in width. Um, and then there's a small communications cable at the top of that bundle. Um, so I know that this corridor looks pretty wide. We, that is actually our survey corridor. That's where we're studying the Sakonet River to give ourselves some room to be able to microsite the cable throughout the river. Um, but the cable itself is only 13 inches. So it really will have a minimal impact in terms of benthic conditions. Okay, and then here we are at Brayton Point, and this is really the meat of our presentation to talk about what we're doing on Brayton Point, what you all can expect as Somerset and Swansea residents. Um, as you all know, Brayton Point is a historic grid connection. Um, there is infrastructure there, highlighted right here, that National Grid already exists, um, that is ready for offshore wind with a few upgrades to be able to take our project um, it, it really is an ideal site for, to connect for offshore wind from a technical perspective, um, but also for uh, you know, a story. It's really exciting to be able to talk about the coal to wind transition and really position Somerset as a leader in the nation, as a town that, that, that's embracing this really, really important change for our future. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Kelly, who is going to get all technical about the Brighton Point stuff, um, and I'll come back in at the end. So over to you, Kelly. Okay, thanks, Kelsey. So some of you probably saw the image as you walked in today. We have it on one of our posters out front. But this map really shows an overview of everything we're proposing to build at Brighton Point. I'll talk through the components, and then we'll get into some of the construction and operations details. But just for frame of reference, um, the entire Brighton Point site is about 300 acres, and that's including what, what Prismian is working on. The boundary of that site is shown in the light blue color. 
And our area that we're looking to use for our converter station is that yellow 10 acre parcel in the middle of the site. So within that 10 acres, that's where the converter station will be sited. So as Kelsey said, that's where the electrical equipment is going to take is going to be located to convert the power from direct current to alternating current, which is what the rest of the grid system uses. So the, the yard will look similar to other substations you've driven past, similar to what's already out there on Brayton Point. And the gravel yard for the substation is going to be about six to eight acres within the 10 acre parcel. So we'll get into more detail and visuals on the converter station in a little bit, but other project components, um, in order to bring the cables to shore, as Kelsey touched on, we'll be burying them under the seafloor, and that, that technique uses vessels, so it's a simultaneous approach where it, the vessel fluidizes like a narrow trench in the seabed, the cable gets laid in simultaneously behind it, and then the sediment settles back on top. So that's how the cables are laid offshore, and then we use a different technique when you get to the landfall location, and that's why you see those magenta lines and what that indicates is where we transition to a method called horizontal directional drilling. So we essentially tunnel conduits, which are empty pipes. We tunnel those conduits under the coastline, and those conduits create a pipeline for us to pull the cables through. <coughs> and that buries the cables deeper under the coastal feature. It protects the coastline, and it stabilizes it from erosion or any considerations like that. That's another one that we have a graphic on coming up. Once the cables are onshore, it transitions to a really typical utility-style method of construction where we're burying the cables in what's called a duct bank. So conduits buried under the existing access roads, backfill that with concrete, backfill that with uh, the soil, and then restore the, the site to the, the grade it was already at. And those cables will route around the site to our converter station um, once it's AC, it's a short run along the dashed line to the point of interconnection at the National Grid Brayton Point substation, which is what Kelsey just showed a moment ago. So those are the major components. We'll come back to this slide once we talk about the specifics a little bit more. To dive into the converter station, um, the bottom right corner here shows a view of what the site looks like currently. So pretty flat, pretty open, just to the north of where the cooling towers stood. So you can still see the remnants of the, the sound barriers that were used there. Um, and what you see on the left is a preliminary engineering drawing. So this is the, the 2D version that kind of labels what's what. And then the upper right hand corner shows that rendered in a 3D engineering software. So don't trust the color scheme. Um, but it, it shows you kind of like this in three dimensions, what the buildings look like, what the equipment looks like. Some of the major features I'll point out, the big building um, in this kind of overall scheme is called the valve hall. So that's a clean environment where the electrical valves do that conversion from DC to AC. Another building you'll see in the drawing and in the rendering is the control house. So that has electrical equipment that talks to the offshore substation, it talks to the operations and maintenance center, it kind of controls, a little bit of the brain kind of controls the whole system. And then the rest of it is really kind of your outdoor substation equipment that again you've probably driven by before so circuits breakers bus work that metallic looking infrastructure and here's what it looks like in just some other project examples so these aren't renderings of our specific project but it gives you an idea for the look and feel so that valve hall i talked about that would be the top image a look inside the clean room that's the bottom left here and then again a view at some of the outdoor equipment so you can see it's kind of got like a metal neutral tone to the whole thing and i'll just add if anyone wants these slides afterwards we're, we're happy to distribute them and then now we're going to take a step back in the process to the landfall so this is a graphic that shows the horizontal directional drilling as a, as a bit of a diagram so you can see how you've got like an offshore support vessel that's connected to the onshore setup, and it's really tunneling the conduits under the coastline. The burial, it's a bit of a, I guess the shape I would use is parabola, but um, the deepest point, probably about 40 feet below the coastline, give or take. And so you would come through and you would install that conduit, and then that creates a nice cavity where you can pull the cables through. So it's a two-step process. Um, I guess one other thing I'll note here, it, we choose this method, um, well, one of the major methods in select, or one of the important considerations in selecting a landfall location is looking for site that are, sites that are previously disturbed, um, 
have a little bit more isolation and separation for the construction process. That's what makes another thing that makes Brighton Point a good site for this project. Um, another thing, oh, another thing is just kind of it protects the existing coastal infrastructure. So we're able to go under the armored coastline of Brighton Point, essentially. And this is a closer look at those sites. So this is the western site. I, I don't know if I hit on this in the first slide, but this is our preferred route for the DC cables to make landfall. And here's a view of what it looks like now. So we'd be setting up our work area in the existing gravel area. We'd be tunneling along those dashed lines under the coastline. And then inland of that, you've got your traditional utility style installation. So what you're seeing in blue is an indication of where the duct bank would be located. Um, every about third of a mile or so of a cable route onshore, you need to have underground vaults installed. And those vaults are a clean environment where you splice segments of electrical cable together. So we would have one at landfall to transition from the offshore export cable to the onshore export cable. And because we have such a short route, there'd probably be only one other set of those vaults. And these images on the right are just a visual of what it looks like now. And this would be our alternate landfall location. So this is if we come in from the east, we would again be working in an existing area that's parking lot, so it's impervious. That would be the setup area, and then we'd be drilling the HGDs offshore to the east and then arcing the route down and around the shipping channel. So just to put it back into context, um, we talked about the converter station, which is the substation in the middle of the site, and we talked about the two landfalls under consideration. The converter station is about, it's over a thousand feet from the, the property boundary. I think that's about <coughs> 0.2 miles. So this is nice and protected within the industrial site. And another great feature for this site is the existing grassy berm that runs along the east side. So it provides really good visual screening for the facility. It provides noise mitigation. Um, and it also is gonna control some of that construction related dust and provide a little separation from the equipment as it's doing its work. So to hit on construction in a little bit more detail, the timeline for the onshore construction activities is gonna be about two to three years. Um, and that's gonna go in phases, so not everything's gonna be going full speed all the time. You're gonna have some time up front to do the civil activities, to do the excavations, to lay the equipment, and then you'll come back and you'll have some more time to do the installation of the electrical equipment. And then at the tail end, it's, it's fewer people doing the testing and commissioning, making sure all the electronics are doing what they need to do, and it's communicating with the grid. The horizontal directional drilling activities, that's a shorter window within that time frame. That's gonna be on the order of two to four months. Part of that's gonna be, yeah, the installing of the conduit, and then a later phase for, for pulling up the cables. We have, um, there's topics that with construction you're obviously gonna get questions about, so we have studied traffic as it relates to the construction activities. Um, overall, we looked at the carrying capacity of, of Brayton Point Road. We estimated the phasing of the different activities and, and what that would look like, and our estimations are that the increase in construction-related traffic is gonna be about 7.5% over what that road sees currently. Um, during construction, we will comply with all the applicable construction noise regulations. We'll be in close coordination with the town, um, talking about the various activities. There are, in general, the plan is to work during the normal construction windows, which I think according to the, the website is 7 a.m., 7 p.m. It might be a little bit longer according to the local noise ordinance. But for certain activities, we'll have to work with the town to allow those to occur for a longer duration. There's some things that once you start, you, you can't stop for safety reasons, or you'd have to do rework and do the whole operation again. An example of that would be some of the HDD activities. So once you start tunneling the borehole, you need to maintain like a constant pressure to keep the borehole open, and that really needs to run continuously until you have that established. Otherwise, you run the risk that you have to start all over a little ways offset from your original intended trajectory. <clears throat> um, with that, there are mitigations you can use around the, the sound, so you can use lower noise equipment, you can low noise generators, for example, mufflers following the Massachusetts anti-idling laws, and temporary sound barriers for some of these activities. Um, and during all of this, as we get more specific and know more about our phasing and when particular activities would need to occur, there will be a project-specific website and, a, and a, a clear kind of communication protocol for keeping everyone up to date. 
So that was a lot of words. Yeah, so here's some images of what these things look like in practice. On the left are some images of horizontal directional drilling. On the top, that's a, a typical drill rig. On the bottom, this is kind of what it looks like as it begins to tunnel under the ground. And then on the right, this would be more of an example of the route once we're already onshore. So you've got the vaults, what that looks like. That's a precast concrete structure that you would bring in and you would lower it into the hole and then backfill. And you've got your access locations flush with the existing ground. And then you can also see on the right what it looks like to lay the conduits and pour the concrete on top to create that duct bank that you later pull the cables through. Um, and then in terms of operations, so Kelsey has a good visual on the next slide that, that she'll show you folks um, that shows what this looks like from key vantage points in the nearby community. Um, you won't see much, spoiler, spoiler alert, sorry to steal your thunder. Um, traffic wise, this is going to be an unmanned converter station. So there won't be a daily traffic, it'll be occasional maintenance of a two person crew in a van, not something you would really notice. Um, and air emissions are also not a consideration for operations of the converter station. Um, we have looked at one of the studies that we conducted for our initial permit filing is looking at electric and magnetic fields. So that study is available on our website. EMFs, even if you're on the site right on top of the cables, we modeled it, it's well below health-based limits and the fields drop off very rapidly with distance. So it's not a consideration for off the site. Um, so again, that full study is on the website. And then I did just want to emphasize as well, Kelsey hit it earlier, that our sponsors, safety is really a priority. It's a priority for everyone on the team. And so we will be following best management practices during the duration of construction and operation to make sure this facility does what it needs to do and, and keeps operating safely for a long time. Awesome. Thanks. Kelly, I will step back in here. So as Kelly queued up, um, we have completed <coughs> visual impact simulations for both um, folks who live on the Taunton side and folks who live on Lee River. Um, so this is for um, uh, from a key observation point from Brayton Point Beach. Um, I know that when you look at the current view in the simulated view, you can't see much, and that's because of that berm um, that Kelly was talking about. So there's a really nice vegetation around the Brayton Point site that, that really blocks the view from the converter station. Um, all you will be able to see, and I know it's very hard to see, so again, I can send these slides, these PDFs are available on our website, um, is this really slender lightning mast, which will be about 80 feet tall. Um, that is for safety purposes to protect the equipment. Um, but that 80 foot tall lightning mast that's very slender is the only thing you'll be able to see um, from the Taunton Riverside. And then for Swansea folks, if there's any of you here in the room, um, this is the view from South Swansea. Um, so again, you really can't see anything. The views actually blocked a little bit more from the Swansea side, but again, you can sort of see the lightning mask right where that arrow's pointing. We took um, these visual impact simulations from seven key observation points, and these were taken in January. Um, so we do anticipate that these visuals would get even better during the spring and summer season when the vegetation was in full bloom. Um, so visual impacts is um, not too bad, we hope. So permitting, I wanted to give you all a quick update on where we are in our permitting process. We really appreciate you all who have been involved in our permitting process so far. Um, so we have you know, made some headway through our permitting timeline. I will talk about the federal permitting process first. Um, so the main piece of the federal permitting process is our construction operations plan, which is available on our website and was submitted in February of 2021. Later that year, BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, who is really the main regulatory body for these, uh, at the federal level for these projects, um, announced that they were going to prepare our environmental impact statement. Um, in February of this year, BOEM released our draft environmental impact statement that's available on BOEM's website. I'm happy to point, it, point you to it. Disclosure, it's 1,600 pages, so it's a bit of a beast of a document, but it has some really great information in there. Um, BOEM held a 45-day public comment period and three virtual public comment hearings with that draft um, environmental impact statement release, and we're hoping to see our final environmental impact statement later this year, um, so we're really looking forward to that milestone. On the state permitting process, we are working with both the Massachusetts Energy Facility Siting Board and the Massachusetts uh, MEPA office. 
Um, so we have submitted our application to the Massachusetts EFSB. That's available on our website. Um, we're progressing nicely with them. I know some of you have um, looked at our docket and saw the information request issued by the EFSB, which we are working diligently on. Um, the Massachusetts EFSB looks to hold hearings on this project in July. Um, so we look forward to informing you all about that when the time comes. Regarding MEPA, um, our most recent filing with that was our draft environmental impact report, which is available on our website. Um, with that filing is the traffic analysis report that Kelly mentioned. Again, happy to point you to any of these documents. That most of them are all publicly available. Um, and of course, as we need local approvals, um, we, we plan to work with the town on any local approvals. We haven't gotten to the point of um, that quite yet, but, but we look forward to continuing to working with lots of town officials. Just a quick overview of the studies and assessments. Um, of course, you know, for both projects, we need 60 permits from federal, state, and local agencies, so it's really quite a big permitting lift. Um, the, this is a really quick snapshot of some of the surveys that we've completed. Some that might be of interest that we've mentioned for this crowd is our traffic study, electric and magnetic fields, fishery studies. Um, again, a lot of these are available. A quick fun update on, on what's going on right now in terms of survey work. Um, just last week, we launched a geotechnical campaign in our offshore lease area. Um, the Frugro Explorer vessel, Frugro is a globally um, known company that, that's helping us with the survey work. Um, their vessel will be out in our lease area for about three months to conduct geotechnical uh, site investigations for our turbine foundations. Um, so this survey work will help us have a better understanding of the seabed conditions um, and continue to help us advance our project engineering. Um, we've been conducting surveys in the lease area since 2019. We've been conducting onshore surveys as well since 2019, um, but this is our, first, our fourth geotechnical campaign. Um, so if you're ever way, way offshore and see this boat, that's us. Just wanted to quickly touch on benefits and, and rounding out the presentation now. Um, so as you can see, um, we are South Coast Wind. We named our project South Coast Wind for a reason. Um, a lot of our project activities are going to be situated right in this little cluster on the South Coast. Um, so of course, why we're here tonight is we are talking about our potential converter station on Brighton Point which is right here. Um, we plan to put our operations and maintenance port in Fall River at the Boarding and Remington Complex, which is you know, less than a 10 minute drive from, from Brighton Point. Um, and we also plan to utilize the New Bedford Marine Commerce Terminal um, for our primary staging and deployment base for construction of the project. Um, if any of you have heard for a uh, vineyard wind, they're using the terminal right now. And the largest crane in the world is actually on the terminal right now, getting ready to build their project. It's bright red. If you drive by, you'll see it. Um, it's pretty cool. So a lot of our activities are, are happening right here. Um, of course, what this is hinting at is the economic opportunity that this project brings, the jobs that this project will, be, will bring. Um, and I, I did want to, um, yeah, and the jobs that this project will bring. Again, on the benefits, um, just to talk specifically about jobs, we did complete a job study where we found for um, the full project build out both projects, the project will create about 15,000 direct full-time equivalent jobs, um, about 27,000 direct, indirect, and induced jobs. We did do a study on the um, operations and maintenance base for Fall River where our consultants found that that base would have about 360 full-time equivalent jobs there. As Kelly mentioned, the Brayton Point um, converter station would be unmanned, so we don't expect any you know, jobs to be based on Brayton Point, um, but we hope that there will be lots of opportunities for folks in this area in general. Of course, also supply chain development. There's lots of opportunity for local businesses to get involved in this industry. Um, we have yet to select our tier one suppliers, meaning you know cables, turbines, things like that. 
Um, once we start making those decisions, we'll have a, a bit of a better idea to help engage local businesses to see how they can be engaging with those tier one suppliers. Um, we do have a commitment that 75% of our operations and maintenance jobs will be locally based here in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, and South Coast Wind has invested over $115 million in initiatives to help ensure that Massachusetts and the South Coast region in particular are you know, really ready to be a hub for offshore wind. We've committed in workforce development initiatives, research and innovation, um, low income ratepayer support, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Um, we're really trying to stand up the industry so that when construction starts in a few years, the local benefits will flow to the benefit of this community and, and, the, and the communities that we're impacting. Um, so lots of benefits to come from this project, both from an environmental standpoint and an economic standpoint. And I believe that's my last slide. So make sure to jot down this, in, this email, info at southcoastwind.com. Myself or my colleague Becca will get it. Um, you can also email me directly, kelsey.perry at southcoastwind.com. Please follow us on all of our socials um, and sign up for our updates. That's the best way to hear about the open house. If you received our email about this open house today, you're all set, you're on our list. If you did not receive an email, make sure to sign up so you can make sure to be in the loop on the next one. Um, so with that, that's our presentation. We are ready to take questions um, and, and look forward to it. So I am going to kind of serve as a moderator slash panelist and we'll be answering and moderating. Um, so yeah. Let's open the doors. <laughs> Hi. Uh, the area you're going to physically build on, have you done any borings in that area? Uh, a lot of that area used to be uh, water holding uh, pits and, that were filled with rubble. Uh, so if you want to make sure that you've got something that you can actually build on that won't collapse in the future, I assume that maybe you've done some borings and done some <coughs> testing there? Definitely. Yeah, that's more of an onshore. Um, so yes, we, it's gonna be important, certainly to understand the geotechnical conditions. We have done geotechnical borings, wrapping up the report for that. Um, the existing conditions aren't a surprise, so we were aware that it's a former cooling canal that was filled in with some coal ash. Um, we'll design accordingly with the foundations. And also environmental testing, that's another thing that, um, another campaign that has been conducted and we're wrapping up our analysis of that information. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So just to follow up on that question, yeah. will you be providing the data and the chain of custody information to us? Um, I guess I'll take that one internally and see see how we, we move it forward. It's certainly something that we'll study and incorporate into our design. Is that a particular concern? Yes. Okay. Make okay. sure the data is collected properly, is transported properly, and analyzed properly. Yeah. Yeah, we, we can definitely, um, we don't have our permitting colleagues here with us, but we, we can take that one back internally to check on that particular data to make sure. Thank we, you. We do, I, I will just note that we do work with some, some really good contractors on all of these efforts. Um, GZA Geo Environmental has been instrumental in our onshore survey campaign and they do really quality work in the region. Yeah, our concern is also related to Prismium. You guys cited in your appendix M that you were relying on Prismium's work on some of this. And our uh, concern is that their data was not collected properly and they are unwilling to release the data to us because of a contractual relationship with um, BP. Okay, pretty clear. Understood. I think that's more of an, an offshore survey. Do I have that right? No, I no that's onshore as well. Onshore. Okay. We can take a look at um, what you wrote up and what we'll follow up on that one. Anyone else? So um, how many megawatts are planned to tie in a breaking point? Is it 1,200 or 2,400? It, do you know what it is? For this project, it's 1,200 megawatts that we're planning. And is there a plan for a, a, an empty conduit for the future for 2,400? Yeah, so I was going to tack on to Kelsey's question. That's a good question. So our lease area has a full build-out potential of 1,200 megawatts. Um, so that's two projects. The 2,400 megawatts. Did I say that wrong? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 2,400 megawatts. Um, so the, the first project will be the 1,200 megawatts. We are evaluating options for the second project for locations to interconnect. 
And in our publicly available permitting documents and engineering drawings, if you pull those up, you'll see there are additional conduits factored into our onshore duct bank. Um, and we would move those forward if there's an opportunity to deliver the full 2,400 megawatts to the Brayton Point area. The idea being that we want to think ahead on that, so we're not certain yet where Project 2 could go, but um, by getting the permissions now to put that infrastructure in, if there's an opportunity to build it, we're only doing the civil works once. So we're only doing the HDD mobilization once. We're only doing the, the conduit and the concrete work <coughs> underground once. Is there anything in that project too, as you referred it, that would go overland in Somerset and tie in and have anything to do with the Montauk power plant in Somerset? Um, I, I guess I would say we're still evaluating points of interconnection for that second project. It's, it's early days for that, so I don't have much more on that at this point. Yeah, I'll just add that we still are actively working in Falmouth. As of now, you know, that second 1,200 megawatts, we're planning to make landfall in Falmouth Heights Beach and, and um, build a substation in the town of Falmouth. Um, there are grid constraints on Cape Cod that have proven to be very difficult. Um, we're wrapped into a, a Q study with ISO New England right now that has kind of just delayed the process in Falmouth. We're still figuring out if the grid can host um, the capacity that we need without major, major upgrades. Um, so that's why, you know, we're, we're kind of exploring these other options. But as Kelly said, we're still working on Falmouth. So we really haven't gotten to um, any point of uh, engineering understanding other than just having those conduits available. So, Kelsey, can follow up to yeah. that? Would it be on the lee side or would it have to come in on the, on the other side? On the on the uh, Somerset side. We're engineering it with the, the mindset that we would use one of the routes, not both. Just so, and then the, per the preference would be for the Lee River side. I, I guess I'll say that we are still in the preliminary engineering phases for everything, but that's the, the intent would be to be able to do, to permit for and do all the horizontal directional drilling activity to one side or the <coughs> other. ISO New England would allow the conduits to be side by side like that? They do have to be physically split um there's a physical the reason for the 1200 and, and and two projects is is iso new england has what's called a single source contingency such that no one single source if for whatever reason it goes offline um, can cause the remainder of the system to to be significantly impacted Therefore, each project, they try to limit to 1,200 because of that single source contingency. So what we're doing is, is we're, we're making sure that the permitting we're putting in place today covers the physical um, requirements for separation of the two circuits. It would be two separate circuits, two separate sets of conduits in close proximity if, if um, that were to go forward. So um, National Grid just came before our committee in town and is talking about putting another plug in on the north side of the Bragg Bridge for a total of 3,600 uh, gigawatts of electricity coming into Brayton Point. Would that be coming from your system or is there going to be additional? you guys have any idea about that project at all? That, those studies are in early days and, and, and there's always these uh, interesting uh, sort of walls put up between the different organizations, so we're aware of it. We don't know the details behind it, um, and that is a possibility for uh, National Grids looking at potential different solutions. Obviously, we're not the only lease area uh, out out there. There's, I believe, seven total uh, lease areas in in the in, in the region. Um, so, all of them are trying to connect in somewhere. So. Brayton Point is one of those places that National Grid is saying, with the right upgrades, might be a good uh, uh, sort of landing point for, for a, a number of projects. So but we'll I do want to add to that before we get okay. on it. So it would be 3,600 megawatts, Wait, not gigawatts. Sorry. And Eric touches on all the lease areas, which is a great point. I don't want folks to get the impression mm -hmm. that everyone's going to look to run a cable to this area. There's a number of projects very mature going to New York, going to Cape Cod. Um, so just to put that in context. What does your studies take into effect what they want to do, or would things no, have to we're, change? We're not, we're not privy to their information and where they're connecting into. Um, same thing, they're not privy to ours because of ISO New England rules. 
So, so the answer to that question is we don't, we don't know. know. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Mary, we can take so, yours. Kelsey, I was wondering if you could respond to this. I have an article here from the Falmouth Enterprise, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to read a, a very short portion of it. It says, the Falmouth Select Board on Monday, February 27th, doubled down on its earlier vote to deny offshore wind developers access to town property. Board members said South Coke Wind lacks transparency and has not worked well with the town. So I would like your response to that. I want to yeah. know what's going on in Falmouth and why there's such an opposition sure. you're doing over there? Yeah, no problem at all. Um, I, I'll address the first sentence first, um, just to clarify what was going on in Falmouth with that article. Um, so supporters in Falmouth actually put forward an article, the spring town meeting in Falmouth, um, that was not exclusive to South Coast Wind. The, the language in the article essentially would be allowing any offshore wind developer to come and do survey work in the town of Falmouth. Um, this was after we had made a request to the Falmouth Select Board to <coughs> do some survey work at the Falmouth Heights landfall locations in particular, hand dug test pits to do archeological work um, to be able to advance our engineering. Um, the Select Board denied us and wanted some more information. Um, and we've been working with the select board on, on answering their questions since then. If you go to the town's website, we actually um, provided them an eight page Q&A document in February, which addressed a lot of those concerns that came up in December. Um, but our supporters in town kind of didn't want to take no for an answer and, and put forward this article that would kind of help all offshore wind developers. Um, so what happened is that article was put forward and then denied at town meeting, but it, it really, um, it didn't have anything to do with our project in particular, um, but I know that can be kind of confusing. And then to address the communication and transparency, um, so things have slowed down substantially in Falmouth, and, and that's really because what I was hinting at, a lot of the grid capacity interconnection issues. Um, for the past year plus, we have been wrapped into an ISO New England cluster study, cluster study one, um, that has been taking some time to look at if the CAPE can handle the capacity we want to bring in and what upgrades we would need to do, what upgrades someone like Eversource would need to do, what they would cost, how long they would take. Um, our Q position was actually pushed out of that study and now we're part of a second study, so we're still waiting on those results. As we're waiting on those results, we have paused um, our EFSB <coughs> process. As you know, we're moving forward with the EFSB for this Britain Point project, but as we kind of figure out those external factors in Falmouth, that is on pause. Um, so there was definitely a gap in communications between South Coast Wind and the community as that was happening. Um, we've had conversations with community members in the town since then just to give them updates. Um, but I think, you know, looking back, we, we could have done a better job of just saying, hey, we're taking a pause rather than just doing the pause. Um, so, so I hope that helps kind of explain the situation, but I'm happy to talk offline so as well. I follow the Falmouth stuff pretty closely. Yeah. We joined all their social media pages and we communicate regularly. Yep. And that does answer some of it, but what if Falmouth denies it entirely? What is your plan B? Is it Montauk? Is it Riverside? So we honestly, we have not gotten quite that far yet. I mean, it clearly through our permitting applications for the Brighton Point project, um, alternatives are being thought about as the, the grid issues on the Cape, you know, continue to drag on. Um, so we're, we're, we're thinking, you know, very early stages loosely about alternatives, but right now, you know, Falmouth Heights is still our preferred. We, we still want to land in Falmouth. We've put in, almost four years of, of work into the community. Um, so we're still planning to, but um, we are not, uh, you know, we're very aware of all the challenges that are going on there and, and the big hurdles that we're going to have to get through to make that work for sure. But as of now, that's our plan. Um, and, you know, our team can only think about so many things at one time. So right now it's Falmouth, this Britain Point project, and, and, and we'll see what happens as the grid capacity issues kind of shake out this year. You're welcome, yeah, and I'm happy to talk about that further. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, construction time. Uh, is there going to be an overlap that you know of between Prismian's construction time and your construction time? Thanks, yeah. Yeah, that one? there is the potential for some overlap. I think both projects are 
I, mean, I shouldn't speak for, for their level of design, but both projects are still kind of figuring out exactly when certain activities would be phased. Um, I believe from the last materials I've read, and I don't want to misquote, I think that there's some elements they're looking to start in 2024, 2025 timeframe. We would also be looking to start construction in 2025. So there is, we are coordinating, but there's more work to come on that, and we'll really have to get more specific in the free, in the timing and the phasing before we can work out specific mitigations and what it's all going to look like. Thank you. Yeah. Not, not to beat a dead horse that might be riding through Falmouth, but yeah. if um, if Falmouth was off the table right now without any changes to the Brayton Point project, is it economically viable for you to move forward with just Brayton Point? Um, yeah. Is it economically? Well, would, yeah. would your company say this is still yes. you know, at so, so, the present definition? Definitely. Right? Um, so right now, the two projects are not um, going to be built simultaneously. They are going to be built in phases. So either way, um, Project 1, South Coast Wind 1, we do anticipate going through that project first, meaning we would build out half of the lease area, we would be working on building our export cable, um, and building out the second half of the lease area, the more southern portion would happen <coughs> afterwards. So we are planning kind of for that stage approach regardless. So um, if there's changes to project two, uh, you know, that's okay. We're, we're sort of planning for different timelines and um, our economics are accounting for that. Yeah. Yes. You, you mentioned you did traffic studies. Yep. Did that take into account the Route 79 closure? The Route 79 which, closure. Which, yeah, the Fall River, which drastically orders all to the pattern of traffic. So what we focused on with the traffic study was on our contribution to vehicles, and we looked at some, some major routes that we could use to get vehicles in and out. We have not done like a separate survey of existing traffic patterns. Um, the findings from our study found a, a pretty small increase, has to use the word small, but relatively speaking, to existing traffic patterns. And the kind of the data that we compared to on that, we know that Prismian did a traffic study as well. So I, I suppose I'd have to probably dig back into the weeds of that study to maybe resolve that question fully and happy to take that offline. Um, but I guess it would depend on, on when they collected their data. But in any case, the conclusion is, not a significant amount of construction vehicles from our project relative to what the local road can take. Okay, the road has already taken more because of the closure of 79, and that just happened. And you're looking at three years, I think, for that project to be completed. So that's three years of altered traffic, much more traffic coming off the Braga Bridge into that area of town. To, to add to what he was saying, when they closed 79, there are a lot of people now that are cutting through Somerset and it's because they're no longer going to the Braga Bridge. So they're, they're coming down 79, they're cutting through Somerset, and they're increasing traffic substantially. Mm -hmm. So there are certain times of the day where the satellites uh, at Rogers Bar is just stopped. There's, you know, there's lines going out on the highway, uh, so there's a lot more traffic there. So um, I don't know if, uh, if there's the ability to stagger, you know, uh, your, your construction work so that you know, you're know you doing it during the day and then maybe, I'm not sure what the hours are, maybe 3.30 to 5.30, you don't have any traffic going through or that kind of thing uh, would, would be helpful. But uh, to his point, you know, you'd have to do some existing traffic study in order to, to know when those uh, windows are that you guys can, uh, can, can get your threats so, yeah. Definitely and understood. Schools yeah. as well, school buses going through, things like that. Yeah. We, we appreciate the insight, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Will there be any type of a community host agreement between South Coast Wind and the town of Somerset? Um, so we are in the very early stages of figuring that out. Um, it, it is likely that there will be some type of compensation agreement between South Coast Wind and um, the town of Somerset. We haven't defined whether that would be an HCA or, or a different type of structure quite yet in terms of um, what that would look like. But you know, we are really interested in, in speaking to the town about that. Um, we want to be a long-term partner and it is pretty standard for these types of projects to have an agreement like that. So we do anticipate um, having something like that definitely down the line and prior to construction. Thank you. 
have there been any community post agreements with any other, like any of the communities in Rhode Island that have already been signed? South Coast Wind does not have any host community agreements yet. Um, it's something that, you know, Portsmouth community and Falmouth community have asked about as well. And with those municipalities as well, we're at the very beginning stages of what those agreements could look like. All three of these towns have very different infrastructure implications. You know, Falmouth has um, somewhere between 5 to 13 miles of cable and a potential substation. Portsmouth, Rhode Island just has the cable. Britain Point, Somerset just has the converter station. Um, so, you know, they, they could kind of be um, set up differently based on what infrastructure is in town and, and how the town is thinking about the projects. Um, but to date, we don't have any host community agreement signed or um, really not even bones to share quite yet. South Coast Wind is just going to lease that property from Great and Twain LLC, is that correct? Yes, that's what correct. The, what is the length of the lease term? Looking at about 75 years. And since South Coast is going to lease from Great and Twain LLC, South Coast won't be paying any taxes directly to the town of Somerset, correct? That's, I don't think that's correct. Yeah, that could be something that is defined within that type of compensation agreement. Like, it's speaking about taxes and um, you know that's kind of all incorporated into that and, and that's a big part of what needs to be defined if there's a tax element or not um, so so you know if there was no agreement there wouldn't necessarily be um, a direct tax impact um, there could be some smaller tax impacts regarding property values for having the asset on the site um, you know we would have to look into current property values and do some analysis on that so don't hold me to it, um, but but it is likely that you know Somerset could benefit through tax revenue for sure. So there was a recent article that um, the Biden administration has uh, earmarked 450 million dollars for, I believe it's five offshore wind ports. Do you know how much of that is coming to Brayton Point? I am not aware of Brayton Point securing any of that funding. Um, but I, I could be missing something. Um, but I'm, I, I'm just not sure. Um, the New Bedford Marine Commerce Terminal could as well. I know that they've gotten a few grants recently, but I'm not sure. Sorry about that one. I'll, I'll, I'll step down if anyone else has questions. I do have more questions, but I'll take yeah. my turn. A uh, couple of questions. Sure. How many workers from the community are out on the vessel that's doing the survey work and your lease area as we speak. From the Somerset community? Yeah. From I, this community that we're talking about providing jobs and so on and so forth. Yeah. Obviously the jobs that are ongoing right now uh, is the survey vessel that's offshore. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if you have anyone from the community out on that vessel working with that crew surveying your lease area. I, yes, I am not um, familiar with the crew makeup. I, I could send you an email afterwards and let you know if there's anyone local. I would be surprised if there was anyone directly from Somerset unless, you know, that person had their particular certifications to go offshore. Um, I know that we are working on workforce training programs now to be able to help people in town to get the training, to be able to work on these programs. Um, so for example, one program regarding survey work that we have is we have a protected species observer training program. Um, this is for Native American tribal members in particular, but we host a yearly program um, to provide cost-free training and all certifications required to become a protected species observer. We've worked with the federal government to waive the bachelor's degree in biology requirement. Um, and we have had three graduate graduates graduate from that program and one of them is offshore on the survey vessel now. So we are working to set up the programs to make sure that everyone has the certifications and health and safety training required to be able to do this work. Um, and I'm happy to, you know, talk to folks in Somerset that might be interested in those types of programs. Um, I will note, you know, there, there's a procurement coming up in Massachusetts that we're looking at. You know, it, it would be great to be able to develop some types of workforce training programs here in town to make sure these benefits are, are flowing to the benefit of Somerset residents. Um, but to my knowledge, I don't know if, if anyone from the town in particular is on the survey vessel. And the second question I have is, um, 
the rebidding process that um, we all been hearing about, reading about, talking about, how will that affect the timeline of this particular project? Can you define just what what your so, rebidding um, process? So um, Mayflower slash South Coast Wind, Commonwealth Wind submitted pricing back when the Baker administration was uh, was at the helm, and um, they're saying now these two entities are saying now that they can't meet the pricing that they submitted back when the uh, permitting uh, um, when the uh, um, uh, pricing was was submitted to the to the Commonwealth. So they've gone back and asked for relief on that pricing and or possibly rebidding those two pieces of leased area under those two contracts. Um, my understanding is that uh, uh, Commonwealth and, uh, and South Coast slash Mayflower is uh, looking to rebid that and probably at an increased uh, uh, price level and how will that affect the time frame on this project? Yep, so I think you're speaking to the Commonwealth Wind Project, who has publicly stated that they plan to rebid into the next Massachusetts procurement. Um, we have not stated to date that our project is not viable or, or couldn't meet those contracts. Um, the global economic conditions that are causing headwinds in the industry impact every single offshore wind project. So we have made statements about that, that you know, the war in Ukraine, the pandemic, all of these things are impacting the global supply chain, which makes the prices that we gave in 2019, you know, a different scenario now. But as of now, we, we, we are committed to these power purchase agreements. So you're gonna hold to the pricing that you submitted two or three years ago? We're having conversations. Um, things could, you know, shake out differently, but we're looking to bring solutions to the table. the subject of supply chain um, obviously Prismian is not going to be in a position to make this wire that you need they're not going to be built yet um, is another Prismian facility making wire for you or is who is making this cable uh, that's number one and then number two the um, windmills themselves are they all coming from one manufacturer and are they already on order or are they is that coming later on Sure. I can let Tim speak to our cables. Yeah, sure. And I think as Kelsey mentioned before, so, so, so we're actively engaged with the, the supply chain. Those would be sort of tier one suppliers, and we haven't selected tier one suppliers yet, even though we're actively engaged with you know them across all the packages. We haven't selected them yet. Yeah. So for either well, for either, for either the turbine or, or the cables. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. We use the term package in house, mm -hmm. and that just means kind of the different work packages yeah. and mm -hmm. collections of infrastructure. So cables would be a package, cables, turbines, yeah. foundations, that's kind of our, our lingo. So none, of, none of them are even on a work order yet? No, we haven't selected quite yet. We'll definitely, you, you'll see press releases and stuff like that once we announce, for sure. How quickly will you determine those uh, tier one packages? Um, prior to construction, of course, and, and then we would um, need some- Are we talking 12 months? Are we talking 18 months? How, how, I mean, what, what do you think ballpark the time frame is? Yeah, it, it's difficult to give a timeline just because the negotiations with these suppliers can really be um, different. But I mean, right now we're planning to our, our very loose timeline. And of course, the permitting of these projects impacts the timeline too. But we're hoping to start construction um, at Brighton Point in 2025. Um, so hopefully we'd be looking to make supplier selections you know, within the next year or two. Because I know the appetite around the world for offshore wind is increasing and if you don't get your order in, um, you could be on the outside uh, looking in. Oh, definitely. So, um, we know, you know definitely. Kinda, I know Mayflower has been talking about this for quite some time. Um, kind of wondering, um, you know, you, you don't have any idea of when you might put that order in and how that would affect the time frame of this particular project. Yes, yeah, so, so I can add to that maybe and just say, Part of it is that different components require different timelines. So we've been really carefully engaging with the supply chain. We sort of know and keep on the pulse of when, you know, when and how long everything takes to get. So a turbine takes longer than a cable, um, you know, or or vice versa, right? You know, depending on what you need to get. So so we're planning on kind of, you know, staging the orders based on that as well, just to make sure things are, you know, things are delivered in time and construction pre work start, you know, when they need to and the right engineering is done with with the folks who are going to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any constraints about manufacturing in this country for this project? You know, like does, does the 
cable have to come from the United States, or does the turbines, or the blades, uh, foundations, any of that have to have, you there's know, no percentage that has to come from the U.S. on this project? There's no requirement in terms of what, like, the federal government puts out or anything like that. Um, we do prioritize local content. Um, right now, there are very few factories in the United States that make these components. Um, I, I can't even really think of any off the top of my head. I know there's a turbine uh, manufacturer, I believe, New Jersey, I want to say. Um, we, we, I could email you and, and send a little list of... Tim might have a partial answer for that. Yeah, it, there's a couple of factories yeah. around the United States, <laughs> but essentially, you know, th there's not enough factories or capacity to be able to manufacture all the products for these um, projects quite yet. So most likely for a project like South Coast Wind that's a bit earlier in the um, offshore wind pipeline will be getting some domestic materials and then and then some international materials based on what's available but hopefully as the industry progresses there will be more investments from both developers and um, the, the federal government state governments to build more factories and make it more of a domestic supply chain um, but that will take you know a, a couple more years decade or so to be able to really build that out to have a strong supply chain for offshore wind here in the United States Um, you talked about, I, I realize you haven't selected your tier one uh, suppliers yet. Uh, New Bedford, I think, I think it was the Chamber of Commerce put together a consortium, uh, I think with Commonwealth Wind, to, to help their uh, small businesses learn how to be tier three and tier two suppliers. Yep. Do you see yourselves joining the same consortium or do you see yourselves building a, another consortium? Um, we could, we'll most likely work. Um, I'm trying to think. I think they might have been working with the New Bedford Ocean Cluster on that. Um, yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> so we but we're, we also talk with the New Bedford Ocean Cluster frequently. Since we haven't selected our tier one supplier, it's a bit harder to do those meet the buyer events because usually the supplier will come with you to kind of explain how they, you know, what certifications are required for them. Um, but we, we do plan to have supply chain events. We have had one in our Fall River office. It was about a year and a half ago now where we just had an open house on, you know, what does the offshore wind su supply chain look like? Um, we'll probably host another one of those this year. And on May 18th in Rhode Island, we are hosting a um, event with Supply RI, which is a, a function of their Rhode Island commerce. Um, and that is going to host a bunch of local businesses um, to speak with our package managers to learn more about how they could get involved with tier one suppliers. So we are working to have events to kind of educate local business on, businesses on that. Um, if there was an interest from Somerset local businesses in that type of an event, I would, I would love to put something like that together. Okay, Nicole? Um, when it's operating, what is the noise level going to be for the converter station? Thanks, yeah, probably. yeah, I can take that one. So that is something that we've studied in our initial submittal to the Energy Facility Siting Board. Um, just looking at, there is some noise producing equipment in the converter station. We do have the benefit of that, maybe we should pull up the image. Yeah, so we do have the benefit of the, the berm to the east, but um, we have looked at what this looks like and we've shown that we can hit the mass EP regulation for no more than a 10 decibel increase on ambient conditions. Um, I think last time we came and talked to you folks, we spoke about the local bylaw and how our understanding had been that the, the limit was 70 dBA at the boundary of an industrial property. We've since had some follow-up conversations with folks from the community and from the town, and we understand that it's, it's meant to be 55 is the limit for nighttime conditions at residential properties. So we're taking another look at this and we're committed to working to hitting that, that requirement. And so the way it, it works in practice we look at the requirement, we understand how we can meet it, and then we put that as a requirement to our contractors who actually manufacture the HVDC equipment. So they'll have a responsibility to show and monitor compliance. And then what is the, so when we talk about two to three years of construction period, what is the noise range gonna be in that time frame? So if you're doing the HDD drilling and it has to continue and it's 10 o'clock at night, what is that going to be like to the surrounding neighbors? That is a good question. It's it's not going to be all the highest level of noise all the time. This is definitely going to happen in stages. 
We do have a construction noise study that we did as well, specifically looking at the HDD locations, and that's another, another one that's on our website. They modeled it really conservatively and looked at kind of the loudest piece of equipment if you didn't mitigate, and I think that the, the loudest sound predicted was around 100 decibels near residential areas, but if you, you add in the best practices of lower noise generators, the temporary sound barriers, that brings it down quite a bit. So it really depends on the construction activity and where that's taking place. The HDD is, is probably one of the louder ones and that's why we modeled it. But I'll just note, yeah, the HDDs of that two to three years would only take about two to four months. So, so, so we look specifically at, you know, which of these durations can we minimize so that, you know, the highest impact activities don't take the entire time. Yeah. And so. two to four months isn't at max sound levels either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but it's that's the whole duration of that activity, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You have to understand, so when you, when you look at that, that depiction and you look at to look at the right look at that close to 200 homes that are clustered and the winds coming up that are blowing the noise towards the neighborhood and you take this project was which is 10 acres over two to three years the two to four months of HDP drilling that's going to be intensified and you layer it on top of the prismium 47 acres that's going to be constructed over multi-year period it's it's essentially depriving those residents of two to four, however many years of, of their, their life. So uh, we have a noise bylaw in Somerset and that, that has to be complied with. And then that runs into my next issue or my next question. So you have filed a motion with the Energy Siting Board for a complete exemption from the Somerset zoning bylaws. Um, do you intend to file any permits with the local town or will this just be through the siting board and the local boards will not have any oversight of the project? I Let me address um, that exemption request first because I think there's a little bit of confusion with the word comprehensive. Um, so we haven't requested an exemption from all of Somerset's bylaws. Um, there are very specific points of exemption that we're looking to get. Um, the word comprehensive in this case, and I am in no way a lawyer, so I'm happy to connect you with the right people on our team to make sure you know if this response is confusing, but essentially the word comprehensive just protects us in the future if the bylaws were rewritten in a way that you know at that point if the project was built and we weren't able to comply, that comprehensive terminology kind of covers us for future changes of the bylaw. But comprehensive doesn't mean that we are just looking to get out of um, you know all bylaws from the town of Somerset. For example, you know there's no um, safety bylaw that in the exemption request that we're looking to bypass or anything like that. Um, so that exemption request is available on our website and I'm also happy to meet with anyone and, and go kind of point, point by point as to why we're requesting these certain exemptions. Um, but as mentioned, you know, as an example, one of the exemptions in there is um, the noise exemption, which, you know, we, we have had conversations with the town and we're still trying to figure out exactly how the bylaw applies to our project and if we're able to meet it. Um, as Kelly said, you know, as we're, we're identifying how that noise bylaw applies to us, um, we're looking to see how we can comply. So, so it's not, you know, I don't want people to think it's this blanket exemption that we're seeking. Um, there's really, you know, pretty specific reasons in there as to why we're seeking exemptions for the particular points because our project just doesn't quite fit in um, to those bylaws. In terms of going for um, any local <laughs> approvals, Right now, um, I don't have any scheduled, you know, we need to seek this approval from zoning and planning or the CONCOM or anything right now. We will need to seek definitely some local approvals down the line when it comes to street opening permits, um, uh, smaller things like that. And in the future, we could come before the, the planning and zoning board. Um, we're just not quite sure yet. Um, I'll give so, an, an example of a local one would be working with the building inspector when we get to the, the stage of putting those facilities up. Yeah. But, but Somerset has a, a plan development process through the planning and zoning board, so my understanding is you're not planning to do that. Plan development is one of the points we're looking to get an exemption on. Um, 
in there, there's a couple of different points in there. One of them that I can pull out um, is the landscaping requirement. There are some safety concerns about planting bushes and trees close to the electrical infrastructure due to, you know, safety best practices to avoid things like fires or damaging the equipment due to root systems. Um, so, you know, it's just something that we kind of need to discuss based on the particular unique circumstances of our project. Um, so yeah, if you want to set up a call, maybe we could go point by point and I can um, walk through them and kind of explain why we're seeking each one. So then just two final questions. Yeah. Um, on the, the NEPA review, so the uh -huh. draft environmental impact report was filed and then there was a comment period that, has that now been extended to May 3rd and was there some type of a supplemental filing that was going to be coming out? Oh man. I don't think, I don't think supplemental would be the, the word. Um, I, I'm not an expert on that yeah. process. We have a, a permitting lead who's yeah. really on top of it. I don't think we're filing anything with me. I don't think there's a supplement forthcoming. So there's the, we filed the environmental notification form, which kind of goes hand in hand with the filing to the Energy Facility Siting Board. The MEPA office reviews that. They issue um, a certificate with comments and questions. That forms the basis of the draft environmental impact report that we filed. Um, and just like, this is actually just like the Prismian process. So then the next step is another certificate and we write a final environmental impact report. So we haven't received, because the comment period was extended, we haven't received the certificate that will form the basis of the next document that we submit. So, the, but the comment period was extended and I believe that you do have until May 3rd. Okay, so, so anyone that wants to submit comments to the MEPA office still has time to do that up until May 3rd. I believe so. Um, the date, top of mind. I know. May, yeah, then, I can double check on the date just just to make sure and, and follow up. Very last question. Um, there has, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this, and if you're not, that's fine. But recently, there have been um, sort of an uptick of swans and Canadian geese that have been found dead on the shores of Somerset and Swansea. Hmm. Has any state or federal agency contacted South Coast Wind to inquire if any of the, the testing or any of the offshore work that's being done has any correlation to that? We would have to double check with permitting just because the agencies communicate with those folks on our team. Um, I'm not aware of getting any type of notification about that to date, but let me double check with our, with our permitting folks because um, someone could have reached out to them. Any, on, in terms of offshore surveys, yeah, there's been no we recent We haven't activity. done any since, uh, since the fall of 2022 offshore surveys, so not, not, not too recently. The ones we've done yeah. recently have been sort of onshore surveys on Brayton Point, for example, inside the more industrial area. So or out in the, the lease yeah, area. Out in the lease area, which is a, yeah, 90 miles away, but yeah. I, it, Hi. it seems that um, conversations with the town have been a bit limited up to now about some of the issues that Cole was asking about. I was wondering if, if have you contemplated a possible extension and adjustment of the deadlines in the EMSB proceeding? Uh, so I asked that is it would be helpful if you would have more information and develop that dialogue a little bit further with, with the town directly before the town is then forced to go ahead and you know file pre file testimony and, and all of those. Definitely understood. Um, it seems like July is a really early date for that, for the stage it's in right now. So. Yep, definitely understood. Um, so we don't have any control over the procedural schedule, unfortunately. Um, that's fully in control of the Massachusetts EFSB, and we definitely realize it's an aggressive schedule. Um, you know, it, it's fast paced for us as well. In terms of communicating with the town, um, we have met with the town on several occasions, but um, we have not given a presentation to the select board since August of last year. So that is definitely something um, if the select board members were interested in, in hosting us, we'd be happy to give a presentation to the community. Um, you know, we, we can look to do more um, community events ahead of July as well. Um, and just to make it clear for town officials that are here, I mean, we're always happy to have a, have a meeting, host you in our Fall River office, come to town hall, um, but we are open to communications all the time. Um, and I'm happy to kind of inquire to see if a select board appearance would be of interest before July. Yeah, but, I, I could follow up with council as well, but it, like for instance, the zoning exemption would be helpful. I don't, 
there's supposed to be a, you know, I forget the term of art, but there's supposed to be a, con a specific conferring on those issues before going into the zoning exemption. So yep. even though you're saying comprehensive doesn't mean comprehensive, that is how the town has to treat it at this point. They have to treat it like <coughs> getting a comprehensive exemption. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, and, and I'm not saying this in an argumentative way, I'm just saying that it would benefit from further dialogue in that formal conferring process that has to go forward. Yeah. You know, before you do that, and, you know, again, that schedule seems very overly aggressive. That, mm -hmm. You know, it would make sense to me to, to, to lay that out a little bit to see where things really stand. Yeah, and, and yeah. Again, we don't have um, any control over that. That that could potentially um, serve as a comment to the EFSB that that the town thinks this is pretty aggressive. Maybe wants some more time. Um, but uh, I, I think that we have definitely made ourselves available to the town. Um, at, we met with the town, you know, just two weeks ago to go over zoning exemptions. So we are happy to meet at any time and, and really do want to progress those conversations as well. So um, we are ready to meet and definitely understood. Yes. Um, after all the construction is done and that building's there and I see the model simulation of noise, what is the noise? What is this noise that's coming from this building? Is it a buzz? Yeah, that's a good yeah, question. What is it? Uh, to be honest with you, you already have the noise. Okay, Brayton Point has a substation. It's it's out there. It's operating daily. We're not going to add any more than that. You already have it. You already hear it. Um, and and quite frankly, the technology we're putting in place is 30 years newer and much quieter. So so the reality of the situation is when we're all said and done, you're not really going to hear any more than you do now. On a very, very quiet night, you may hear a, a, a buzzing sound, like a, a, a bee or something in the background. Furthermore, our, our footprint is being built in a bowl, okay? We've got this earthen big berm around it, which Kelsey showed pictures earlier, where you can barely see the tips of the, of the proposed lightning mass. So sound radiates out, it hits a berm, it's going to go up. It's not just going to go flood your neighborhood. So the likelihood of hearing much out of um, our facility, I won't tell you it's zero. That would, be, that, that, that would be a mistake. But it's going to be extremely low, and it's going to probably be no different than what you're hearing today. And I, I want to differentiate slightly, because I know there's been other activities at Brayton Point. And so baselining against what you hear today um, it's just we need to kind of take it in pieces and I've you know I've visited the site many times and have walked right by the existing substation and for me at least I have to get pretty close to it before I hear anything so that's just a bit of context as well I hear it. And, uh, so I, I definitely hear the, the substation that's there now I hear it right. so if it's no more than that then I guess I can understand that. But the other thing to keep in mind, I, I know we have a burn there. We all know what the, where the burn is. Uh, but there are a lot of sounds that actually travel through the ground. Right? We, we, we share the same bedrock. So uh, you build a building, you put equipment on it, you bolt it down. Uh, our houses, uh, foundations go into the ground. And uh, it, it's incredible how some of the, the sounds that you might not hear outside, you can hear when you're inside laying on your pillow. So, uh, so just something else to you know, keep in mind. But, uh, so, is there another um, one of these converter stations anywhere nearby that uh, that someone might be able to drive by, get out of their car, and say, "Oh yeah, that's a familiar device." So. Hmm. I can look into that. I, yeah. I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm sure that there's infrastructure nearby that would be really similar, um, kind of off the beaten path that that okay. folks could go and see. I'm a big fan of reality. Yeah, so I think there's a, a good. been some brand new upgrades to the station right near Montauk. I think that's right near right near the road, not too far from Town Hall. Is that the same type of? Uh, it's it's so not an HVAC. That would be a, yeah. That would be HVAC of a different voltage. Yeah. HVDC in Massachusetts is towards the north of the state. That's the nearest one, and that that runs to Canada. So that's a bit of a field trip. Well, we, we sometimes make field trips. <laughs> <laughs> I can find the address for you yeah, and follow up. Yeah.
I guess, could you go back a couple of slides where you had the site of where you're going to um, put your building? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right sorry. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> so, right to the left of where, um, above the two old tower locations, is a green area. Right here? Yes. Okay. That, I believe, is an AUL site. That's correct. A tombed area. Your construction excavation, how close do you think you're going to get to that? We will be outside of it. I understand that. I, my guess is you're about 40 feet, 40, 50 feet. That's probably, so yeah, not too far off. equipment and things like that. My question is, are you going to monitor and take samples of the soil there, borings, to figure out this site, the AUL site, has been in tune for 30, 40 years, is there any potential leakage? Will you be checking to see that? So we'll, we've d we're in the process of finalizing an environmental study for our areas that we're looking at constructing on. And the, the way the process will move forward, um, we expect that we'll work with the Department of Environmental Protection and that the, the kind of regulatory framework that's fit for our case is called a URAM, so U Utility Release Abatement. I forget what the M stands for, apologies. Um, and that's kind of the framework under which we would have a soil management plan. And that soil management plan is gonna dictate the best practices for how the material is handled, how worker safety takes place, um, and it's all based on what we find from the environmental studies. So we will be outside of the AUL, but we will also be complying with all those best practices to make sure everyone stays safe and the material is tracked appropriately. And that material that you excavate, I assume you're gonna dump someplace? Our, our hope is to, or our intent rather, is to reuse as much as we, we can on Brayton Point. And because that's all part of the uh, implosion of the towers, a lot of that we believe may be contaminated. So we're going to reuse that. We'll reuse what we can. Um, and then obviously there's existing landfills on site as well. So that's, that's a little down the road of figuring out those logistics, but we'll follow the environmental regulations of the state, absolutely. Yeah. Yes? Uh, my question is about decommissioning and the time frame and, and cost. I think we were all surprised how quickly the cooling towers didn't last. Um, so what is the time frame for earliest decommissioning? Are license extensions allowed? Will for the cables be left underground? Will the converter station be left? And finally, I read that there was a softening of the amount of capital you had to set aside for decommissioning. Is that, is that accurate? Or how much do you need to set aside? Sure. I, I can speak to um, the turbines themselves, the, pro the lease area, and maybe you can talk to the converter station. So for the lease area, um, we lease that swath of the ocean from BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Technically, our lease with BOEM is 33 years. Um, and at 33 years, there would be you know, an opportunity to renew that lease. Um, it is a requirement for companies like South Coast Wind and all offshore wind developers to put together a bond for decommissioning to have those funds in place if we were to have to, you know, decommission the project entirely. Um, but I will say that most offshore wind farms around the world and Europe and Asia last longer than that. And, and we would be looking to, you know, have an operations and maintenance space to be able to maintain that equipment. Um, but there is a, a strict plan in place if we did have to decommission the turbines. Um, but that lease is for, you know, that's a separate lease for the offshore wind lease area. And then I think it's a different situation for the converter station. Maybe I'll, I'll start the converter station answer. I bet Eric will chime in. But transmission infrastructure has a tendency to become a long-term asset. So, for example, Brayton Point has not been operating for quite some time, and yet there's still um, a prime point of interconnection location. So that substation is still part of the regional network. It's still doing its job. Um, so in all likelihood, we talk about the, the lifespan of these things, and we talk about decommissioning, but in all likelihood, the converter station would be a longer-term asset that's part of the transmission system. That's absolutely correct. And and we would be looking to, to maintain it and, and extend the life of it be it replacement of, of components or replacement of, of pieces of equipment to do exactly that, um, to extend that. Um, obviously, the longer we can extend, the more we can generate and the more we can benefit the, the, the community. 
Um, but certainly there's always a time when, when the asset is no longer in use and that would go back to the decommissioning bonds that, that we're required to have. Thanks. Is there someplace where we can see an exact list of the exemptions you're asking us for? Yes, definitely. Where so is that? that, is that with our EFSB it's, it's in the zoning exemption petition, which is posted to our website with the EFSB. On the it's, South Coast Wind website? Correct. Yes, on our documents page. If you go to our documents page, click on state permitting. Um, it's towards the bottom of the page, and it, you'll see it says zoning exemptions. Um, if you can't find it, again, take my card, and I'm happy to point you to any of those documents. And what I to follow up on that. So um, you seem to be relying heavily on that berm to mitigate noise in the neighborhood. And right now, they're still breaking up concrete where those two cooling towers were, and it's the same berm. Yet we hear it really loudly right now, just while they're smashing up concrete. Mm -hmm. So. The fact that you said there will be 100 decibel, and I understand there's spikes, it's not a constant, but 100 decibel spikes um, is really frightening to have to relive that again for another two to three year construction period. So that burn is not going to help us. What are you going to do furthermore to mitigate the disruption to the neighborhood so that we can open our windows for the next two to three years while you're building? That burn is no help to us. If you go down there right now on any given lunchtime, and listen to the concrete breaking up, it's ridiculous. It's bam, 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 constantly. Yeah. It shakes our neighborhood. So the 100 decibel spice is is very concerning. Definitely what understand. What else would be doing to mitigate sound? Yeah. yeah do, do you want me to take that? Yes, yeah, so, so I think, as we mentioned, that the, what we expact to be the most noise emitting, uh, noise emitting activity is the HDD. Um, the horizontal directional drilling um, and the you know the benefit there is that it's in a relatively contained area so we can erect sound walls around the construction area which can directly mitigate sound so it's almost kind of having the two barriers in place right so the first sound wall and then you know then the berm which you know helps to mitigate the sound and then uh, you know we can look at equipment muffling as well so so other mitigations that we can we can put on the equipment itself plus the sound wall around the site itself so, so there's kind of a, a few tiers of mitigations that we'll look into and as we get further in construction we're, we're looking at everything we can do to comply with the noise bylaw so we're in the process of reevaluating the model with our the 55 db i have some preliminary results that look really good and i think we're, we're not trying to bypass the noise bylaw we're trying to understand how you're we can not comply. asking for an exemption from the noise bylaw we are to so that's to, why. to to cover confusing. it it is confusing it, it's definitely a legal kind of protection um for aspect you or for us for for you but it, it's a standard procedure that these projects go through i mean if you look at any other offshore wind project they submit zoning exemptions for the municipality they're in you can look at vineyard winds um exemptions with the town of barnstable with the dpu that was a very or not the efsb which was a very similar situation um but as kelly said you know we put together that zoning exemption um, we have to put it forward at that place in the permitting process with the efsb but we've continued to work with the town to see how we can reach these requirements and comply with some of these bylaws um, i definitely understand it's a confusing topic and I'm, I'm happy to connect you with someone on our team who is working on that a little bit more actively um, but but yes we're looking to see how we could comply and it, it, it's a standard procedure in these projects to you know seek this type of exemption so i think kelsey hit it, it well at the, the top when we were explaining the noise exemption petition which is that the comprehensive means forward looking so that doesn't mean we won't study the project and commit to complying with the current bylaw um, it just is that the initial document we put forth and now we're going through the process of having the conversation having the Energy Facility Siting Board public comment and intervention process, that's all to collect feedback and it all informs you know, what we show next, how it gets better. It's not very reassuring, to be honest with you, being someone that lives within a couple of hundred yards from that facility, that we just went through this for two, three years, the construction, the noise, which got now I know that has nothing to do with you, but to ask us to do it again, is really upsetting. Like I, I didn't know you were asking for an exemption from the noise bylaw, or possibly asking for an exemption from the noise bylaw. So that's going to get a little bit of pushback from us, unfortunately. I hear you. Um, and I know that we don't have control over it because you're going around it to get it, to get the exemption, going around the town to get the exemption. So um, we need to work something out here because we can't do this for another two or three years. 
We definitely understand and, and definitely understand the history of the site is not something that, you know, we have looked over. Um, you know, we, we've really taken that into consideration and understand the concerns. Um, and as Kelly said, I mean, we are reevaluating our noise study and hopefully, you know, in the next couple of months, we'll have something good to share with you that will hopefully be able to meet that 55 decibel limit at the residential property. Um, but yes, de I definitely understand the concerns. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh, has anybody studied the wind, wind direction and the effects of noise uh, as far as the wind is concerned? Because the wind directions down there change constantly. They, yep. um, sometimes more than once a day, the wind directions change. Um, I understand you, you've done all these comprehensive tests for noise. Does that, do those tests take into consideration prismiums, noise levels? I know you don't have to prove with prismiums noise levels that you're complying with the Bible, but I think you know between your activities, prismiums activity, Great Point LLC's activity, um, the noise levels, I mean, you may meet 55 decibels, but all three of you combined are not even gonna come close to meeting that. And then factor in wind direction, um, it's, it's brutal. Like, I mean, I remember when the scrap metal was down there, um, I, I could hear it clear as day from my house, and I lived a mile and a half away, and she couldn't hear it at her house. She lives 100 yards away. Mm -hmm. So it depended on the wind direction, uh, how it affected the noise levels. So are you taking into consideration everybody's activity when you put together your noise reports, or just your activity? Yep. Um, so in terms of the wind conditions, our noise studies, our ambient noise readings do include weather conditions as part of that assumption. Um, of course, you know, as you said, that the winds change constantly on Brayton Point. Um, so, you know, our ambient noise levels will say these are the weather conditions that happen that day, but other things could happen um, over the course of construction. Um, in regard to cumulative yeah, I mean, just touching on the wind just a little bit more. So that is mentioned in the in the report that we submitted. Um, I understand that it's a factor. When we collected the ambient measurements, it was a quiet, it was intended to be a particularly quiet condition. So it was in the winter, no activities were taking place. But um, I hear you on that point, and it's probably something I'll have to go back to our, our modeler on, who's a bit more of the expert on this. Um, and in terms of the cumulative impacts, we have studied our project components, so that's that's a fair point as well. We have not considered the, the I guess the, the projects that aren't part of our purview. <coughs> it's over. It's past eight, so maybe we could take one more question and then anything we didn't get to. Again, my business cards are up here. I'm happy to grab a coffee. Our office is about five minutes down the road on Main Street in Fall River. Um, answer via email but happy to take one final question tonight if anyone wants to go for it oh, oh my gosh there's two what do we do <laughs> flash round flash we'll do them quick <laughs> has the site ever been officially classified as a brownfield site and then my next part of that the concern is the two to three year construction window we know it's contaminated soil. You're going to see that in more examples. So will there be testing done to ensure that any contaminated particulate matter from that construction operation is not flowing either to Swansea or to Somerset? So what, what protections will we put in place so that the residents in the town can guarantee that we're not being doused with contaminated particulate matter? So we will be engaging with like a licensed site professional who, who does this for a living, who tracks the material and follows the best practices, and that'll all be part of the process with the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection and the soil management plan that we develop. I guess that's the kind of the most detail I have at this stage on, on that point, but that would, the intent with that process and why it's so regulated is to control what moves where and to be able to track everything. Um, I know there was a part one to your question, but I might need to use it again. Is, is it a, has it oh. ever been classified as I guess I, I, having looked at the definition from Mass EP and EPA, it meets that definition. Um, and just in, in terms of the particulate matter, um, 
you know, we're all familiar with the license site plan professional with putting plans on paper. Um, what I'm looking for, and it's fine if you don't have that tonight, but an assurance that there will be actual testing, not only for the quantity of the particulate matter, but the contents of the particulate matter, um, and whether that's doing baseline testing in the neighborhood and then following the project as it goes through. Um, two to three years is a long time, and the exposure for particulate matter a couple of days affects people's health long term. So um, I'll, I'll be raising that issue um, and following that issue closely. So I would encourage some of those twins to be doing the same. I would, I would just tell you that the, the portion of the construction period that we're going to be digging up anything um, is going to be relatively short uh, in the early civil campaigns. And then once those are done, it, it'll all be uh, fill in what's left and, and, and work on inside buildings and on top of the ground after it's completed. So, so from a particulate standpoint, from contamination that you're referring to, um, the time frame is going to be significantly shorter. Um, probably less than six months, but nonetheless, to, to your point, um, you know, we can certainly take that 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 first part of the question back. So I think, and this is the point here: yeah. is that the ground is contaminated now, and we're worried what's flowing now. And then on top of that, as Nicole suggested, after you start digging, what's that going to bring up, and where is that going to go? And is it going to go to the areas after you've done your things and you just have contaminated soil, which is going to flow? Understood. No. <clears throat> Would you okay. volunteer if we wanted to apply to DEP as citizens to have a public participation in the uh, excavation of that material for DEP? Would you guys object to that? We tried it once with Green Point and they wouldn't allow sure. it. Um, would you voluntarily allow us to be in that process? Or following that soil. We'll have to take that one back as well. I know that's not a satisfying answer for tonight, but we're not the, the permitting team on this effort, and so we'll have to engage our colleagues on that. Okay. I, I would suggest to taking it back to your permitting team. And we will. Talking about the timeline, talking about extending the EF3 proceeding. And yeah, not we're, we're not going so to be able to extend the. No, you can't, but a motion can be filed and it would be granted immediately. If to by the okay. Well, perhaps that's something we can discuss yeah. between the town and, and South Coast yeah. if necessary. I mean, you don't, you don't want to be forced into an adversarial position on certain issues that more time will give you the opportunity you know, to reach a satisfactory resolution with the town. Understood, definitely. I'm happy to connect you with my uh, colleague, Dan Hubbard, following. Yep, last one. I have two points of clarification. I appreciate your uh, transparency. Uh, your petition to DPU for exemptions is posted on the town website. Oh, great. I assume, I assume somebody in your team gave it to us. Uh, it has been sent to the town. I'm not sure if it's on the well, town I, website. I had, it was posted early. I had time to read it. And great. The point of clarification is please don't, when you map uh, the project impact perhaps don't map Gliding Hearn in Fall River. That, <clears throat> that's like scratching fingernails on the chalkboard. You, on your map, you, you had gliding her and our, our ship builder. It's in Somerset. Oh, was it mapped wrong yeah, on the map? map? Oh, oh sorry about that. I know the gliding herns in Somerset. I promise. Ryan's here somewhere. We know them. Yeah, th sorry about that. That was a mapping mistake. I'll have to slap my graphic designer for that one. Sorry. Uh, we know it's in Somerset, though, definitely. Um, okay, well, we really appreciate you staying a couple minutes over, and we appreciate all the questions. Please do take my cards. I'd love to sit down with, with all of you and discuss your questions. So thanks again. We really appreciate it.